Back in the saddle again. Well, that's an old reference, isn't it? Paul Ihander with you on this Tuesday edition of Next Up on 99.9 The Fan. Thanks for making us part of your ride wherever you are headed. Shout out to all my delivery drivers out there as you start the grind. Having carried a twin mattress up three flights of stairs once as a delivery driver, I have much respect for y'all. Just saying. Insta on the ones and twos on the other side. Graham Hill is here. Graham, good morning. What up? Hey, so about last night, uh, you and I were both there. A lot of other folks were there, too, with the uh, Carolina Hurricanes doubling up the Chicago Blackhawks and what was, I think, two-thirds of a game for the Canes, in my opinion. I mean, it was it was over early. The Chicago Blackhawks have essentially nine or ten guys on the scratch list, some healthy, some not. Uh, but they're running an AHL team out there at, at at this point, and the Canes really weren't in doubt. They did manage to, I say the Chicago Blackhawks, did manage to get 17 shots on goal, which is two more than their win total, Insta. Yeah, I mean, we going into that third period before the Connor Bredore show sort of happened, and they were able to make it a two-goal lead um, or just trim Carolina's lead to just two goals. We were kind of asking, well, the question now is, do the Chicago Blackhawks match their win total for the season on just shots on goals for the entire game since they were going to the third period only a total of eight shots on goal while the Hurricanes had like 32? It was a drubbing of all sorts for the Carolina Hurricanes, so no letdown after the big road wins. They just keep on rolling. They get contributions from pretty much everybody up and down the roster, the the guys that you want scoring, Sebastian Ajo, you know, getting a goal. Marty Natchez with a very, very clever uh, clever bit of puck handling to score there as well. Again, not really much of a doubt in this game, but I did say it was roughly two-thirds of a game. Before we get into that, let's hear from Sebastian Ajo, get his thoughts on the win. Yeah, uh, solid win. I mean, just uh, through the lineup, up and through the lineup, it was uh, pretty solid. Uh, good start. The guys obviously uh, got a good lead there, and uh, that was pretty much the game. 21st yeah, no, straight um, loss. Yeah, I know, I know. He's like, hey, it, it's, yeah, we got pucks deep. Yeah, good stuff out there. Played both ways. Great job by Spencer. Yeah. Kept, uh, controlled controlled things on the boards, kept the puck in our zone. For the record, I'm not making fun of Sebastian. Otto. I know I, I just love, I just love his, his Finnish accent. It, 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 it's, it's. It, Ajo, like many other hockey players, give the most kind of hockey answers when it comes to a game like that. Because what are you going to say after a 6-3 win? Yeah, we got things to work on. I think they do have things to work on. Uh, one being try to contain other team star players. Uh, where Connor Bedard on a second straight night had a goal turned over because of an offsides. Uh, but he ended up scoring twice where the Carolina defense essentially forgot about him on his first goal. And then the second goal uh, was it was an assist because it was a redirect, but Bedard, being kind of the special sauce player that he is, just delivered it right in front of the net to I think it was uh, who was it? It was Tyler Johnson yep. on the power play. So I mean it was power play goals, which is why you don't criticize Spencer Martin for not getting it. Like if this is any other crazy night, like that could have been a shutout for Spencer Martin. Well, think about this. If this had been any other night, that 5-on-3 to start the game that the Blackhawks had could have been disastrous for the Hurricanes. Blackhawks power play. Uh, Paul Ihander here along with uh, Instagram. He'll next up here on 99.9 The Fan. Thanks for hanging out with us. Blackhawks power play is like me throwing darts after three beers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know what? I think there's something over there. I'm just gonna start hurling stuff at it. Now, they say you no know, ones in the wall, right? I mean, like it's, people are ducking, you know, beers getting spilled on the floor and on the pool tables and stuff. Uh, you know, Nick Foligno's shot at the end of the second, well, towards the end of the second, was a backhander. He had no business making that one, but that's what he does. That's how he scores. And Connor gets a point on that one. Connor gets his goal because the defense forgot about him in that third period. They forgot. I mean, if you go back and look at that play, you see everybody swarming to the puck to the left of the net where Martin is facing, and all of a sudden it's just this little shuffle pass uh, from Kurashev, and Bedard's just there just to kind of dink, dink it in, and he gets his 17th goal, and then he assists on the other power play goal. So Chicago's power play, yeah, at the beginning of that game, not so strong. Third period, a little bit too sleepy uh, for the Canes, and then Martin got the, uh, got the alley-oop saucer where uh, Jarvis kind of snuck one in between two defenders, and, and Marty was able to drop that one in. But... Overall, I mean, if that if those are my big complaints, 
uh, uh, just kind of a little bit of sleepiness because you're up 5-1 and there's still, what, uh, 12, 13 minutes to go in that game? Yep. Those are my big chief complaints. I, I don't think I could say much more than that. Other than it's a positive, it's a positive uh, uh, spin for them. Positive goaltending play of which, remember, not too long ago we were all screaming, and I was one of them. And we've had many hallway conversations around here, and I'm sure a lot of you out there have had the same things when you watch the Hurricanes. You're like, oh man, we can't buy any luck and goal. Like Freddie gets hurt, Auntie Ranta gets sent down on waivers. We got Pierre Kachetkov who gets hurt, and we think he's the guy, but he's not the guy. And now we have to bring in Spencer Martin. Spencer Martin all of a sudden is a world beater. Like, he had big win over Vegas, solid mom's weekend win, and then he comes last night. And to be honest, what happens with goalies and having, uh, in my in my world, I, I've uh, uh, hung out with a couple of goaltenders who have played at fairly high levels, at okay. the NHL level and the collegiate level. Big flex. Goaltenders are strange bits, but what they always tell you is in games like this, it's really hard to stay focused. You get the early catches, but then you don't see a lot of action. So if you noticed last night, and you can't see it, unfortunately, on the telecast, but if you were there in person, you will have seen uh, Martin kind of like skating between the boards. Like he was skating during some of the some of the downtime where they were chasing pucks or pucks go out of play, or if there was a timeout, you would see him kind of move back and forth because – it looked like to me, and I'm sure you could ask him the question, but nobody did last night, is that he was just trying to stay engaged because he wasn't really having to do much. I mean, as you mentioned, they had fewer than 10 shots in the first two periods. He wasn't facing anything. Like, he was sitting there pretty much just squirting water into his mouth, admiring his helmet because there was nothing coming his way. But he loves playing in front of PNC Arena, and it's been great for him to come play in Carolina. At least that's what he says today. Uh, it's, it's been a special opportunity to, like, to play with a, a team like this and uh, you know they're obviously really talented guys but also the way that they brought me into this locker room has uh, is felt uh, it's just really building my confidence as well so uh, yeah what is that song behind him by the way is that like breaking the law dirty deeds dun, dun, dun. is that what it is dirty deeds that's honestly my favorite part about going to the Hurricanes locker room after a win is to see what songs they're bumping like post game while they're doing their workouts it's interesting uh, you know, after last night, also it was so six three, Canes over the Blackhawks, in which President's Day, by the way, across the NHL yesterday was squirrely. It was nuttier. Is what do you say? Nuttier than a what? Nuttier than a payday bar. Nuttier than a payday bar. Uh, the uh, Minnesota Wild scored ten goals against Vancouver's seven. Three different players register a hat trick. Yeah, you had uh, overtime in Seattle where Detroit beat Seattle four to three. Uh, you had a ton of high-scoring games across the league yesterday, including this uh, doubling up by the Canes over the Blackhawks last night, 6-3, to three, which ended at the perfect bedtime for everybody. But you also, who also kind of woke up, speaking of bedtimes, Jesperi Kokanyemi, who, after two months, finally gets on the board, and he knew it was a drought, he knew he was thirsty, and he was just trying to stay focused. Yeah, I think, you know, just try to think more like a simple way, you know, the little things. Not, uh, I feel the goal is going to come, you know, just, you know, as, as long as you work hard and, uh, you know, do the same simple things, right? Little things turn into big things. Like, there is that, it takes a pebble, right? It's one pebble in the water creates the ripple. When you start building a fence, you start building a rock wall or protection or something around yourself to get yourself propped up, it has to start somewhere, like one thing, right? So he had a point over the weekend on the road trip. And then he comes back, puts up a goal. It was a very nice goal, too. Like he had, it felt like slow motion as he yeah. was measuring that one up and went glove side on Mrazek, who had no chance. Like he didn't, it, it, it felt like he didn't even try to react to it. He was just like, all right, let's see just what happens here. Uh, it's good for him. It's good for the Canes to get him going. Because with with the with the line mates that he's with, they're trying to shoulder that load for him. And we saw round numbers last night. Kokinyemi getting his tenth goal of the season, Aho getting his tenth goal of the season, Svech getting his twentieth assist on the season. Uh Aho also had another helper later in that game. He almost has Aho's got fifty nine points right now at this point in the season. I mean, he can still, if he gets rolling and get gets hot again. He can get things moving. And Seth Jarvis was kind of everywhere again last night. Yeah. Like, Seth Jarvis, Mr. Entry-Level Contract right now, is gearing himself up for a payday that will be like no other if this team wants to believe in what he can do, and I think they do. 
Martin Natchez playing strong in the middle of the ice. And also, as you mentioned, guys contributing, Michael Button, Brett Burns, Jordan Martinuk, also scoring for the Carolina Hurricanes. You, it's good to just see guys contribute, whether it's in the score column or not in the score column, kind of like what Rod Brennamore talked about last night in the postgame press conference. Yeah, you roll your eyes at a five-on-three power play. You know, but you escape that because of who you're playing. You may not get to escape that later on, but the ice certainly was tilted, at least for the first two periods in this one. And again, I'm, I have minor, minor, minor complaints about this team. It was a nearly complete game for the Hurricanes. Great news for Spencer Martin, who apparently has erased a lot of the questions about what this team needs to do 17 days before the NHL trade deadline. Yes, 17 days left to see if your Canes are going to make a move. You'll be hearing about that throughout the day, I'm sure, during Adam Gold at noon and Tim Donnelly during the drive from 3 to 6. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 999 The Fan. Martin Natchez and Sebastian Ajo each had a goal and an assist, and the Carolina Hurricanes, who have won three straight and eight of ten, beat the Chicago Blackhawks on Monday night. Spencer Morton had 14 saves to win his third straight. Turnovers doom Duke women's basketball in a 70-62 loss to number 19 Notre Dame. Duke plays at number 17 Syracuse on Thursday in the third of four straight games against a currently ranked top 25 team. Duke rises to number 8 as North Carolina falls to number 10 in the latest men's college basketball AP Top 25 poll. UConn remain atop the poll for the sixth consecutive week. Find these stories and more on WROSportsFan.com. Next up, we preview NC State versus Syracuse. With you here next up on 99 The Fan on this Tuesday edition. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you missed any portion of this uh, program or any of the prior shows, because we are at show number seven right now. This is the one with the Canes, if you're a Friends fan and you understand that reference. Uh, find us on YouTube, 99.9 The Fan, YouTube, sla- youtube.com slash 99.9 The Fan, or wherever you find your favorite podcast, just subscribe to Next Up with 99.9 The Fan. We are a full-service Sports show in the morning. Get your day moving forward. Uh, NC Central last night and Norfolk State played top of the MEAC conference last night. Central lost, unfortunately, 80-74, which dropped Central into a 1-2-3-4 five-way tie for second place. Central was a team that was showing up in a lot of the early bracketology and some of the bracketology still thinking they could get past Norfolk State because this is pretty much is going to have to be an automatic bid kind of play. But Norfolk is playing some pretty good basketball right now. So the MEAC sounds sort of like the ACC. It's got a little bit of that vibe. There was a collective face palm across the ACC last night, which did not really help up in Virginia, where the Virginia Tech Hokies beat Virginia 75-41. Like that, it was just this giant slap. It wasn't uh, Martin uh, slamming his... Uh, stick on the ice to signal the end of a power play end or signal the end of a penalty end or a penalty kill. It was Virginia Tech just blasting Virginia, which is not good news for the ACC if it wants to seek more than three bids. 75, you know it's a bad game for you when the home team is running out 13 guys. Like They're just, the guys are just like, oh, you want me to go in the game, coach? Yeah, you need to go play four minutes. Do something for you? Nah, just go play four minutes. That's all we got you to. That's all we need you to do. Yeah, poor Tony Benton. I can, I, only, I can only imagine what was going through his head last night. Virginia is struggling right now. They are struggling to the finish, which is again not great news for the ACC, but positive news for a team like NC State, which, as I mentioned leading into this, is the first of six must-win dubs. All the dubs. NC State right now, and we're gonna. I think as we get to the end of, not I think. As we get to the end of the regular season, I'm going to start referring to teams not necessarily by record, but by seeds. And so right now, Carolina and Duke are at the top, one and two. That is it. They are in a clear horse race to see who wins the regular season title. Not the not the conference championship, but the regular season title with Virginia's loss. Virginia is the three seed now. The four, five, and six seeds are this jumble, State, 
Pitt and Wake Forest. Pitt on the heater right now, five in a row. So Pitt's kind of got the got the foot on the gas, and they have the records to prove it home and away. They can do it in both locations. But tonight is about the five seed, technically the five seed with NC State and the nine seed Syracuse. And Syracuse does not want to be on the outside looking in, even with two fewer losses. They can close that gap with State. So Virginia and Virginia Tech kind of messing things up to see if we can get that four seed coming out of the ACC. It's not impossible, but one of these teams has to get rolling. Pitt obviously is trying to make sure that that stays in play. State wanting to make some runs here, knowing that they got that big win on the road at Clemson, and they can build on that. There's no doubt about it that they can do that. Here's a little scouting report as Syracuse and the zone defense du jour comes to PNC Arena tonight from head coach Kevin Keats. Well, I think a couple of things is they're they're really good in transition. They do a great job. I mean, they get the ball out quick and they try to get the ball up the floor as much as they can. Um, you know, we the last time we played them, you know, quite honestly, they took 32 free throws and um, that didn't work out for us. We only got 11, so we didn't do a good job in that area. And I think Judah Mintz himself took 21. And so we, you know, we got to do a good job with that. And I think now because he doesn't have as much depth, um, they're starting to have a mixture of a little bit of man and some zone. And so I think that's a couple of things that we got to, you know, work on. Usually, you know, when Coach Behan was there, you knew preparing for um, Syracuse, you had to spend, you know, every minute on their zone. And now I think, you know, what Red's doing, he's playing a combination of both. So you got to do a little bit of both now. So you got to do a little bit of everything. But Syracuse is still mainly a zone team. Like, that, that is what they do. There's There's no secret to that madness. Syracuse plays zone defense, and they do it really well. They did it really well against North Carolina, which was not great news for the Heels or Hubert Davis, but that's what happened. Now, for them to make some magic happen tonight and to get some things rolling, we all know who it's got to go to. Say hello to the bad guy, DJ Horn, who talks about his role as leading scorer during pack therapy with Graham Hill and Tim Donnelly. As far as the scoring, um, you know, from day one, we also talked about, you know, Jarkel and uh, Baby T leaving. So I uh, knew it was going to be a wide open window as far as, you know, needing that needing that to be replaced. So uh, for me, it was just like I knew this was going to be a perfect situation if I was going to, you know, want to be a scorer. The must win for the guy who's going to do all the scoring for this team. Like, just shoulder the load at this point. Yeah. I mean, it's so funny how at the beginning of the college basketball season, we always try to evaluate about, like, uh, who are the top guy is going to be, and you know, who's going to be maybe the three musketeers? And to a point, there is some of that there. You still see some of that, like with North Carolina. I think a little Monterey Bay got R.J. Davis, Harrison Ingram, yep. Duke, Jared McCain, Tyrese Proctor, Kyle Filipowski, NC State. We might would want to say D.J. Burns, Jaden Taylor, or insert Casey Morsell in that conversation whenever he wants to, you know, play to his potential. But I mean, this is this is DJ Horn's team. I mean, this is DJ Horn is what Cat Barber was for NC State's roster during his time playing there. What Dennis Smith Jr. was to NC State's roster. We're not going to talk about that season, but this just feels like this team is DJ Horn's team right now. These teams are evenly matched, and you're right about Horn. Syracuse has the same kind of guys. They got a stud backcourt. Judah Mintz is is the man with the orange, and both these teams as they try to figure it out. And get things going here against the. I mean, they are incredibly evenly balanced. And when it comes to wins and losses, it's the same kind of bit. And also playing tonight, just to throw a little monkey into the wrench, just to set you all up. Pitt takes on Wake Forest. So right now, as we talk about the must wins, the all wins six for state, and it has to start tonight because Boston College, Florida State loom, and then you close out with the three teams that will give you the hardest of challenges. Carolina, Duke, and Pitt, because they all realize what's happening, you're going to need some guys to step up and make things happen. DJ Burns, this is it, dude. This is it. Sweat on the court, sweat off the court, sweat everywhere. They're going to feed you the basketball. You're going to have to be that slick DJ Burns passer that we all have grown to love. We want you to dish and dive as guys are cutting at you. Like, Horn's going to come cutting at you. Morcel's going to come cutting. They're going to double you in the post and make you beat them. So beat them. Use that size of yours. You have the one of the most impressive low post set of moves for a big man in all in this entire conference. 
Like, all these other dudes, they just kind of like, they're like trees, right? You're like this sequoia that comes stepping in there. And you might be just a half beat slower than everybody else, but you make up for it with your intelligence and savvy. Show that off. You got six games to do it. Tonight would be a great night to get that started. They drop in a zone, you're going to get the ball. Because not everything's going to fall from outside. But I do like the idea, and we've talked about feeding the big man, feeding the big man a lot here with Baycott, which turned which turned out really well in their last game. Filipowski, not so much because of foul trouble, but DJ Burns, man, you're getting the starters minutes. Make them pay. Make them pay for every time they underestimate you. Spin. Move. Get mean. No smiles tonight. Smile when it's over. Smile when it's over.